today's theme I have called Modernity and Orientalism. And Orientalism is a theory. Well, Orientalism is a, is a, is a big thing, actually. Modernity is also a theory. It's a theory about... Modernity is like a theory about historical time that we're in, a his, historical epoch. Orientalism is either the study of the Orient and all things Oriental, or it's what Edward Said says about the people who studied the Orient. Uh, and by the Orient, they used to mean um, North Africa and um, um, not East Asia, not Far East, but the, what we would now call the Middle East. But that has expanded, obviously. I'll get to that. So modernity and Orientalism. And I'm, what I'm going to do in the first half is give you some terms, concepts, a bit of theory. The second half, we're going to look at some films and stuff, right? So that you'll get the theory, get some terms, get some concepts. Then you'll get some experience of exploring the, the film. So here's a list of relevant concepts. It's quite small. Don't worry, don't try and, you can try and type them out if you want. But the lecture is being recorded and <coughs> the notes are online. So, modernity historical epoch. It's sort of now-ish. Some people take it back to the 18th century, some people take it back further, 16th century. Western modernity, right? modern era. Orientalism, in the first instance, just refers to a scholarly discipline. And it got famous because Edward Said wrote a book that basically denounced the whole endeavour. Europeans who studied the Orient, North Africa, the Middle East, and later on further into Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, argued, Said says it's deeply problematic. It's very, very problematic. It's not racism. Far from it in many, in many ways. It's often the love of, or fantasies about, and interest in different cultures. But it's problematic. Um, and it's problematic specifically because it amounts to a problematic form of representation. So representation is key here. And by representation we mean the ways that something other, something else is depicted, shown, um, communicated to us. And representation is a really crucial concept of, of say, media and cultural studies and, and certain aspects of philosophy because it's an inescapable aspect of human culture and communication. We talk about things all the time that aren't there, that aren't physically present. We talk about things that don't necessarily exist. We still talk about them. We can represent them. We can depict them. Unicorns. Santa Claus. God, maybe. These, you know, these things, they're not... We can't... They're not... Pre society. Hmm? Like, we talk about society as if it's a thing, but it's not. Like, where is it? You know, well, you can... Anyway, there's no escaping it. Another concept, Eurocentrism. And this means evaluating anything according to European values. It was a term that was first... Well, not first, but it was definitively theorised by a guy called Samir Amin. And he wrote a book called Eurocentrism. Um, and that's put in Europe at the centre of everything, like as if Europe is natural, best, superlative, right? Like it's like the norm. Eurocentrism. We evaluate things in these European, North American kind of terms. Colonialism. Um, sometimes we jump straight into post-colonialism. When, when we like, cause that's where the funky theory is. That's where the cool theory is. Post-colonial theory. But uh, a lot of the times we don't really take account of what colonialism is. Oh, I think Channel Four this weekend. Um, there's at least part one of a two-part series called something like, I wrote this down, hang on, nine o'clock, I think, Channel 4, it's called Empire State of Mind, Channel 4, Saturday at nine o'clock. I haven't seen it yet, obviously. Um, and it's about British Empire, British colonialism, and I guess, I'm guessing it's about the now, the effects of, of British colonialism. So colonialism is the largely European, but not just European, um, expansion and control and domination, violent suppression, obviously, uh, often, of large parts of the rest of the world. Post-colonialism just means after colonialism. 
some people hyphenate it when they mean after. Sometimes they don't put a hyphen in and they mean like post-colonialism as a field of study. Um, deconstruction is, we're going to be talking about deconstruction quite a lot, increasingly for the rest of the module. Um, this is a, a, a radical approach to pulling things apart and reconstructing them that was developed mainly by Jacques Derrida through the 70s, 80s and 90s. And then a phrase that's relevant for the rest of this module is the politics. The politics of representation, it derives from the argument that all representations are biased, all representations are constructed, maybe from a Eurocentric point of view, from a European point of view, and you construct a representation of something else. So it's biased by your position and by your own values, your own norms. And we can see what are the politics of this representation, how we represent another ethnic or cultural group, how we, repre how we represent them, how they <laughs> represent us. These are all extremely, possibly consequential um, matters, because they can affect how we treat others. And that's where Orientalism is really important. Uh, Said, specifically interested in the representation of Palestinians, Arabs. The way in which the European world has represented Arabs, is that's mainly essentially what he's, he was interested in. And he, may, and he said there's some remarkable continuities and it often produces ways of thinking and ways of relating to the other which aren't positive, right? Which are often violent, often can produce violence. So, I just want to, I want to whiz through this and don't worry if, if this doesn't all sink in because I want, I want to get through this to the fun stuff and the good stuff and the interesting stuff about like Aladdin and things like that. <laughs> this is the first year I've banned Aladdin and the first year I've decided to talk therefore about Aladdin and why I've banned it. Um, which the, what is representation anyway, right? There's a correspondence theory of representation that representation merely represents reality and that when we talk, we're talking about real stuff and it's straightforward, we're either telling the truth or telling a lie. It's more complicated than that. We've already looked at semiotic representations. You can, you can represent a situation and it can connote different things. It can have mythological, ideological effects. We've done this. And then the way deconstruction, the way Jacques Derrida and the post-structuralists think about representation is that all representations are, in a sense, inventions. They're constructive. You can, you can re-present things differently. And then you've got your postmodern theories. People often group these together, but I'm going to set the rate, I'm going to pull them apart and say there's a difference between deconstruction and postmodernism. The argument that reality so this is Jean Baudrillard, especially people like that. Reality has been lost in the media saturated world. There is no truth anymore, there is no reality anymore. And then you can apply different kind of paradigms like feminist or post-colonialist, for instance, these are the most relevant ones for this module, and look at rep structures of representation, conventions of representation. We've looked at Laura Mulvey already and we've seen that when you look through the, the, the kind of her theory, her psychoanalytic theory, and you start to look at the way in which representation works, you can argue that there are dominant and patriarchal, often sexist, often misogynistic styles of representation. And then, what, where we're going to get to after this week and into next week is thinking about post-colonial issues around representation, essentially based on observations that European and, and white American Euro-American modes and institutions dominate an awful lot of the world. Not the whole world, what we used to call the first world. First world. We used to call first world, second world, third world. First world is like capitalism, Europe, free markets, English language dominates. Second world was like Soviet Union, China, communist countries. Um, third world was the developing world. Right? China sometimes was regarded as both second and third. And so you had all your Africa and all India. And, but that shit's old now, right? That's, things are different now. So I don't really hold with 
the correspondence theory so much? In the, I just don't think that language and representation ever works in a straightforward, neutral, innocent, objective way. I think it's always more complicated than that. Something we can discuss. So the big theory for us, right? And we are going to charge through theory. I don't want to... I want to spend more time looking at films in a bit. Edward Said. You might have bumped into this before on other modules. Yeah? Good. So we're already flying. 1978, quite a long time ago. And I'm, I've been rereading this book recently. And it's a good book. It's a readable book. Um, I, I recommend having a bash at it. It's not too hard. And also... If you go on YouTube, Google Edward Said Orientalism, you get lectures by him, interviews with him, where he's really clear um, on what it is. I used to show some of these, these, these videos and stuff, but they take up a lot of time. So in your own time, you know, if, you, if you're confused about any of it, just Edward Said himself talking about Orientalism. There were videos made by, the, by MEF, the Media Education Foundation, where he's been interviewed by people, and really nicely produced ones from maybe... 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, he died... Um, when did he die? He died sometime like 2000 and... I want to say six? Something. Anyway, something like that. He was certainly very ill then. He, he died of cancer. Um, so in his 1978 book, Orientalism, with the subtitle is Western Conceptions of the Orient, Said argues that there has been a long tradition of what he calls Orientalism among Europeans. Orientalism now is kind of like um, a, a, a word that has a negative connotation. But you could still be an Orientalist. You could still study Orientalist issues. People don't identify with the term anymore because it's been so like, battered by Said and, and post-colonialism studies but there are still you know you've got still like the school of oriental and african studies in 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 the university of london soas you've got it's still it's still a thing um but said argues that there's been a long tradition of formal orientalism the formal academic study the scholarly linguistic historical cultural anthropological study and then general interest in the orient which is also very orientalist and what said says that orientalism has oriental, it, it is orientalist, and that is it, it, it operates in a certain way, and it tends to simplify and to rom either romanticize or demonize the East, the other cultures, the non European cultures. Simplify and romanticize. Um, and when Said's talking about this, it's really, it's really uh, interesting. So he's, you know, he's at university. Um, I'm not sure if he studied in Europe, but he certainly ended up studying in America. And he's studying literature and culture. And he's from Palestine. And he's looking at, you know, European literature, poetry, visual art about uh, of 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 the Bible lands. The Bible, you know, it's a big deal in in Christians and Jewish and uh, Islamic um, concept. Like it's a serious area. It's an important one. And he's reading them and he goes, there's a continuity between, across these representations, there's regular themes, regular styles of representing Jerusalem, Palestine, that bear no relation to his experience of it. So, on the one hand, so he, this is really important, he's not simply saying these are false, these are lies, he's saying... Where, did, where does this structure of thinking and this structure of representation come from? And it's just, it's often people who either have been there and romanticise it, or then people are reading this stuff, they've never been there, so then they write about it or paint pictures of it. Imagine the crucifixion and the Garden of Gethsemane and the blah, 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 olive trees and all, the, all these things. They've never been there. And he's like, wow, this is, this is a thing. This is a... A, a structure that repeats itself across centuries in, in European thinking. And this is what he calls Orientalism. Fantasy representation of the other, a structure of thinking, a, a way of creatively imagining the other, the other place, the other people. And then he argues that this structure isn't simply a, an innocent, neutral fantasy of another place. 
it actually tied to our experiences of and our thinking about the modern world, like here, in say Europe or North America. And it's like, so the other becomes everything that here isn't. So you kind of look out the window and go, oh, it's a bit shit here, it's cold and it rains and there's unemployment and there's industrialization and there's no poetry and no beauty, it's just dirty and muddy and horrible. Wouldn't it be great if, and you imagine the other place, like a kind of Eden, like a Garden of Eden, and you go, wow, fertile lands, untouched, beautiful nature, innocent people, blah, blah, blah. And that's the, so the structure of your fantasy is determined by this, like you're in this urban modernity, this shite. Wouldn't it be great to go to the beautiful untouched lands so it becomes sexualized straight away, gender. So here's male, right, masculine, Western world, Industry, boom, colonial, power, guns, money, men. Over there, fertile forests and blah, 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 blah. Female. So, there's a kind of sexual metaphorics. Actually, and sometimes you read Said and it's, he takes it a little bit too far, I think, and utterly sexualizes everything. But you get these different tropes, these different ways of thinking. You get binaries, binary structure. Here, there, us, them, modern, natural, nature, ancient, modern, ancient, culture, nature, etc. You get these binaries. So you get inversions and displacements and projections onto the other. European images of the East are often formed by inverting and projecting. We see this in some films. Um, but in the process, Orientals, the people who live there, they're simplified and binarized themselves. Um, they're either good or evil, noble savage, or, or fiendish and devious and scheming and not to be trusted. Virginal or incredibly sexually um, experienced and all the rest of it. And this kind of maps onto male kind of screwed upness about female sexuality that's bothered kind of cultural thinkers forever. Like, Lacan said that the question is, what does woman want? He didn't mean that like that was his question. He said that's like the question that men are like, what does. They even made a film about that. What does woman want? Or something, starring Mel Gibson, which was demented. But that's a. It's not a Lacanian film. It's not very good. Uh, I can't recommend it. Anyway, the Orientals become homogenized as a group. Them, the other, they're all the same. What are they like? People still write about the Chinese mind as if there's a Chinese mind across billions of people and hundreds and thousands and thousands of miles and, and, and vast complexity. So it's not, this isn't racism yet. But you're not far away from it, right? This is not racism. It's generalization, simplification. We have a complex. This Gayatri Spivak, Gayatri Spivak, who is a, a post colonialist um, theorist and cultural critic, said it goes like this I, me, I have complexity. I, am the, I, I have character and complexity and issues. Them, you can homogenize them. They are all like this. All students are, all women are, all Chinese are, all, you know, Americans are, right? The other becomes simplified in our representations, and that's what we need to watch out for. Binary. Binary structure, binary thinking, oppositions are what we look out for. Um, because they're, they're, they're not reliable. One of the things that I've asked you to read... Um, there's a chapter written by Stuart Hall um, who was uh, one of the founding figures of British cultural studies and he's like widely regarded as um, like a really great intellectual like a really great um, <coughs> activist and, and so on he's, he, he died as well a few years ago which is sad um, he wrote the chapter at, at the end of this big book called Formations of Modernity called The West and the Rest 
And I think that it's one of the best introductions to Orientalism, Edward Said's thinking, and Michel Foucault's thinking that you can find. I always like to introduce people to Orientalism first, and then maybe Michel Foucault later, because um, Orientalism is a really clear representation of some of Michel Foucault's idea. So Stuart Hall connects Orientalism with European imperialism and colonialism. Um, and in context of imperialism and colonialism, the other, the other people, the other place, is regarded as essentially inferior, even if it's regard, they are regarded as noble, noble and beautiful and brilliant and still inferior, largely because they don't, or they're regarded as not having Western rationality or science or they don't have the power or, or whatever. So Western culture is regarded as superior, more advanced, more rational, etc. And representations of the other as inferior have always played a huge role in justifying Western domination. All different, some ways are ostensibly caring, uh, and some ways are um, outright, outright racism. So ostensibly caring is we need to go and civilize them and introduce them to Christianity and save their souls and blah, 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 through to they need us. They could never develop without us. That's when you're really getting into the, to the mindset of, of, of imperial and colonial domination. And that's a massive part of history. From the cultural theory side of things, Said is, gives a really excellent introduction to Foucault, which I will say more about in a little while. Um, and next week, I'm going to show some... Um, we're going to go much more into this aspect of colonialism, colonial domination, colonial violence, imperialism. We'll say, say much more about that. At the minute, this is we're going to be looking at Orientalist representation, which is... Which is different. Edward Said's book, um, Orientalism, is often regarded as like one of the founding texts of the field of post-colonial studies. Didn't really exist as a field until after his book, so we're doing Orientalism first, and then we look at post-colonialism. And I know this is full on, and I know we're doing lots of theory, but trust me, it's all films in the second half. It's all just films, and cartoons. Um, Said's argument is based on the work of Michel Foucault. And Foucault argues, and Foucault will come back, so you don't need to grasp everything about Foucault in this slide. Uh, Foucault was going to come back over the next few weeks of, the, of the, the module as well. Foucault is famous for a few things. One of them is his theory of discourse, that the world is dominated by discourses. That's what makes the world. Um, that's what establishes what knowledge is, discourse. And also his phrase, power knowledge, which in French would be pouvoir savoir. Right? And he puts them together, and because he was French. Right? They also have other phrases that are associated with Foucault, where he talks about biopower. It's another Foucault phrase. Also, another big one of Foucault's is technologies of the self, which we're not getting into. There's like two different aspects of Foucault, which often overlap. Foucault argued that we kind of grow up in, in discourses and in disciplines. Foucault studied the historical growth of disciplines like psychiatry, medicine, <coughs> and institutions like um, the psychiatric hospital. Um, because we look at these disciplines now, we might look at a psychiatrist or the field of psychiatry and think that's just like that's essentially just looking at someone or something, studying them, going, hmm, and that, that, that power isn't there. And Foucault said, no, if you, if you just need to look at the history of these institutions. <coughs> they come from the lunatic asylum, where people were just thrown and, and chained up because they didn't conform to social conventions of behavior. And psychiatry grew out of that. And psychiatry was always invested in the issue of power over people. An individual psychiatrist might have no power, or lots of power. 
Um, and psychiatry is a form of social power, a form of power knowledge. Think about someone's on trial. Someone's committed a murder. Are they just bad or are they mad? The psychiatrist assesses them, comes up, expert witness, and says, this person is uh, sane. Okay, you go to prison. Go to the, to the death chamber or wherever, the death of the chair or whatever it is. This person is mentally uh, unwell. Okay, they go to the hospital. It's all the same. No, it's not all the same. It's very, it's very subtly different. The knowledge is invested in networks of power. So this is a quote from Foucault. There is no power relation without the correlative constitution of a field of knowledge, nor any knowledge that does not presuppose and constitute at the same time power relations. So, knowledge about is power over. This is where Said comes in. Said argues that the Western forms of knowledge about uh, North African, uh, Middle Eastern countries, and later on uh, other countries, um, is always was always a type of power over. Always, it was always used as part of what Foucault would call biopower. Um, Said is specifically interested in the cultural representation. So Sa Foucault was interested in documents, legal documents and, and policy documents and like um, designs for things, designs for hospitals because like that's where, that's where things ch happen, that's where things change. New laws, new legislations, um, new institutions like psychiatry for instance. He's interested in the birth of these things. Um, Said's interested in the representation of things and the way they feed into our consciousness. So literary, poetic, um, travellers' tales, artworks about, say, the Bible lands, the effects that they have on us. Um, Said argues that Western images of the Orient have real effects of many kinds. Um, Said was also coined the phrase imaginative geography. Um, and he wrote an essay called something like Imagine Geographies. And he starts from, I don't know if it starts from this, but he says, like, it's always amazed him that from the Middle Ages onwards, a priest or a bishop or a pope or a king could exercise people's imagination so much in Northern Europe, in Scotland, in England, in Wales, in France, to say, to say the Moors have taken our Jerusalem and people would go right and they'd go off and crusade and he's like what is how and for, for Said it's because of the imagined power of the geography of, of, of the Holy Lands like, like Christians think they're theirs <coughs> Christians in the northernmost parts of northern Europe think that's ours that's Jerusalem that's ours so did Jews, so did Muslims. And he called the imaginative geography. It's a really interesting concept. And it'll be relevant. It could be relevant for your film analysis later on. Geography plays a part in our representations of things and what we, how we feel about them. And it has real effects on us, on our nationalism, on our patriotism, on our fantasies about where we want to go on holiday. But of course, we won't go on holiday. We'll go travelling, right? Because travelling is authentic and real and cool and... Tourists are bad and it's inauthentic, and we'll get to all of that too. So, Orientalism is reductive, it produces stereotypical thinking. All Arabs are blah, blah, blah. All Asians are blah, blah, blah. Right? The other is simplified and denied complexity, which is what I was talking about, Gayatri Spivak. I am complex. They are all the same. They are dumb, they are stupid, they need us help, or whatever, right? So Orientalism, even if it's a, even if it's like a loving kind of celebration, even if it puts a country or a culture on a pedestal, if it romanticizes it too much, Said argues that's just as bad. So even when it's really not racism, and you disconnect it from racism, many of the Orientalists that Said writes about loved these foreign countries that they went to, and the foreign languages and philosophies and religions and everything. Still, if you romanticize them too much, you can still have negative political effects at all levels, national, institutional, personal. 
about which there is much to say. Um, I have too much to say about this. It's too interesting. It's too interesting to me. <laughs> so, so apologies. 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 What time is it? What does Orientalism look like? What time is it? Twelve o'clock. We'll do one, and then we'll have a break. Short breaks. This is the. This is to get you out of the theory part. What does Orientalism look like? Hmm. We'll do one film, and then you can have a break. Ta-da! So, Aladdin, 1992, Disney. I asked you not to write your essays on Aladdin, please, because it's just shooting fish in a barrel. So, this is the start of, of um, Aladdin. It's the song, Arabian Nights, Where's My Volume? So you're looking at the images, you're listening to the sounds, you're listening to the sounds. So some of you are singing along with that. That's all right. I won't. I won't deduct any marks. Um, <laughs> so, so the, the nineteen ninety two lyrics were where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's Bob Barrett hates home, and people went, "Hang on a minute, Disney." Isn't that a bit something? A bit racist or something? A bit something? And so they change it to where it's flat and immense, and the heat is intense. It's Bob Barrett but hates home. Um, and it, you're looking at the visuals, you're listening to the sounds, which are all exotic and Middle Eastern, and the landscape is very striking and very non-European. So the words would be exotic. But then you dig down into the, into the cartoon a little bit further, into the film, and you see binaries. So the character goodies... They're all lighter skin toned, Western, ostensibly caricatural Western models of cuteness or beauty or attractiveness. American accents! The baddies, dark skin tone, non American accents, foreign accents. Uh, then you've got faceless hordes, all the same. All the soldiers, all the same big knives. So you have a, a, an almost perfectly negatively orientalist um, kind of semiotics going on. That's why I say you can always start your essays from semiotics. You just look at what, what are we literally looking at? Okay, desert, things, maybe pyramids, whatever. But what is that doing? What is it doing? We've got the westernised beauties, but exotic enough, you know. Neither black nor white, but Beyonce, yeah, that's acceptable, right, okay. Do you know what I mean? There's lots of debate about this, about the, the acceptability of the non-white, but that non-white has to be a kind of coffee-coloured, sort of, because it can't be. And there's, there's, we're touching on massive issues here, but still, we've got it here. A bit exotic, but not too, not too sinister. Magic, mystery, fiendish and devious, right? Orientalism. Orientalism looks like this, um, and I don't want you. I don't want to read any essays about it anymore ever again. Okay, let's just let's just leave it. Let's just draw a line under it and do some more interesting things. It's not your fault. 
I'm sure you would have all done really different essays that would have not just been about this here that I've just said. Or oh, they would, wouldn't they? They would have done exactly this. I would have 50 presentations on this, 50 essays all on this. Um, do you need a break or do you want... To, now that we're into the films, it's easy now. You're like, ah, feet up. Let's not have a break yet. Let's just, let's just go. Let's just stretch and relax. Because this is the easy bit. So, Orientalism, Western representations of the Orient. Um, Said argues that the long tradition reflects kind of long... Uh, embedded kind of Judeo-Christian fantasy structures about often about religion and then they get mapped onto to racial things. But we can take the idea of Orientalism forward and we can also take it to China. And we can look at the um, the first, not the first ever, but the first kind of filmic representation, literary first, filmic representations of Chinese characters and we can tie them to some stuff, some bigger stuff that's going on in the world. Why does a character emerge at a time? Why does something ignite our imaginations at a certain time? Maybe we'll never quite clinch the answer to that, but um, Sax Roma started to write um, stories um, that were being published weekly about Fu Manchu in the in 1913 was the first book and these these are kind of Sherlock Holmes like so much there's so much Sherlock Holmesy stuff going on in there there's the, the main uh, uh, the, I think it's like Nayland Smith and uh, I'm forgetting the names now but there's so, so it's almost like there's the Sherlock Holmes character and his kind of sidekick and so on and Sherlock Holmes had been, you know, Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes, hugely successful. And Sax Roma comes along and creates a new character, 1913, but this has been serialised before this. Now, what's happening around 1900 that might be on the minds of British imperial consciousness? The biggest thing is summed up in the phrase the Boxer Rebellion, Boxer Uprising. So, through the 19th century... China had been subject to massive European intrusions for complicated economic reasons and essentially was, was subjugated by, by Russia, by Germany, by Britain. Britain got certain treaties in certain areas. Hong Kong is one of the areas. Um, Germany got... Um, What's that beer called? Qingdao. Germany got Qingdao, which is where the best beer in China comes from, right? Germany. Beer! <laughs> Brew some beer! Right, anyway. Um, so, Boxer Uprising, anti-foreigner protest, anti -fo not po protest, anti-foreign uprising in, in Chinese cities. And this kind of stuff going on, like the natives rebelling, the natives rising up, kind of makes people go, hang on a minute, shit, what happens if, God, there's lots of them, shit, what happens if, and you start to worry about the, the other, hmm, what would happen if, and then the argument is, so I'm getting this argument from um, an essay called Modernity's Yellow Perils, by Ermila Seshagiri, I think is the, is the name. And she argues that the, the, the interest in Fu Manchu, who is, what, so what is Fu Manchu? He's a Chinese genius, master of science, master of magic, master of languages, also a master of all of the, um, the, the global connections, the ports, Chinatowns around the world. Fu Manchu can pop up anywhere. Fu Manchu has an army of people available to, 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 do, to do his bidding. Shit. And uh, Seshagiri argues that this is a reflection of colonial anxieties, imperial anxieties about the global network that has been created and the kind of the problems and the, 
and the risks and the, the, the places, the fault lines of, of, of modern globalization. Um, the semiotics of it are essentially kind of racist caricatures. Fu Manchu in, on screen was always played by a white actor. Um, and there have been many iterations of this type. So Fu Manchu becomes a type, a stereotype, an archetype. Fu Manchu was already derived from um, characters such as magicians, um, such as magician uh, Chung Ling Su, who was massively successful as a magician and was British and was white, but like lived his whole life as his persona, uh, his persona of uh, Chung Ling Su. So I wanted to, and I, this, so there's, this is fabulous stuff. This is non-film, so don't worry about films in this. There's a long history of exoticizing the East, and this was such a great book, Conjuring Asia, Magic, Orientalism, and the Making of the Modern World by Chris Goatee-Jones. And Chris Goatee-Jones looks at the history of ma ma the magician show, what a magician is, and looks at the different species of them. And obviously the popular one in Europe was always the orientalized one, always the Indian or always the Chinese or always the, 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 the Middle Eastern, North African. But then there were other types of magic, your pen and tellers of the world, right? Who like go, well, this is science, this is just science. Or your Darren Browns, right? Who, and there's a huge, this is different. I can't spend any time on this today, but it's such an interesting thing. There are lots of different currents that feed into the creation of a character such as Fu Manchu. The kind of, uh, in Freudian terms, it's a lot condensed into it and it displaced. It's, it's, it's a displacement and condensation of a lot of issues. Fears about the, the British Empire, fears about China might rise up, fears of the yellow peril. This was the first yellow peril fear um, of the 20th century. This is just absolutely bloody fascinating stuff about the status of magic um, in the modern world, which um, we haven't got time to talk about now. Fu Manchu morphs into Ming the Merciless. So Flash Gordon was a comic book character that became a TV series in the 1930s. Um, I used to watch, this stuff used to be on when I was little, right? And we used to watch it as, as if it was good. <laughs> like, I, I remember this episode. But it was made in the 1930s. So, anyway, we're looking at it. Looking at the visual simul... So Ming the Merciless, by the way, um, Ming the Merciless is, um, is not of this Earth. Flash Gordon is in space. And uh, Ming comes from a planet, which I want to say is Mars, but I actually don't think it's Mars. I think it's got a fictionalised name. So he's a, an alien. But let's just look at the visual construction of Ming the Merciless. And look at the special effects. How did they do it? But look at Ming's palace. Let's see 3PO. So look, so we see Ming. I mean, even, even the word Ming, I mean, there's an entire dynasty, right, in China. It's very, very orientalized. So here, the, the most other, the most alien, the most exotic and scary is depicted through semiotics that are East Asian, specifically Chinese. So there's a direct kind of intertextual or genealogical connection between Fu Manchu, Ming the Merciless, heavily orientalized, Bad guy, fiendish, bad, right? Uncaring. So the visual semiotics of the other, the alien, are orientalist, racist, really. So orientalism can just shade straight into, it can just slide, wee, into racism. Or it can become something else. Ming the Merciless is just the wee, into racism. Um, and it's part of a kind of a trope, a regularly recurring 
set of images. Then we have the occasional appearance in Western cinema of um, the Oriental female figure. Anna Mae Wong was one of the, the probably the first. She was the first Chinese female film star in the West. And she was over and over again forced to play not just, it's, it's hard to even call them stereotypical Chinese roles, just like stereotypical Chinese roles as imagined by someone who'd never actually seen anything Chinese but had heard about it. So you've got like, it's almost like you describe, it's almost like you're playing Pictionary or something, I don't know, and, and try to go, I've, de I've never been to China, I don't know anything about China, but this is kind of Chinesey. So Anna Mae Wong had to play these roles where she was ultra orientalized, but from someone who didn't know anything, anything. So, so this music isn't, sorry, I'm just going to stand. So the music, get down is actually, this is music added on to the YouTube film rather than the, this isn't the music of the film. So, again, China, something, I'm going to say China in inverted commas, is what? So there's quite a lot to say about that, and actually Anna Mae Wong's life is, is really interesting. Um, I mean, Anna Mae, she was born in San Francisco, and um, she actually struggled against that typecasting. She wanted, she's just an actress, she wanted to just act, she just wanted to be a performer, but always had to be typecast as the exotic, the exotic female other. Um, another huge staple of of what, this is just copied and pasted from Wikipedia because I thought I, I can't put it much better than this. So this is from the Wikipedia page about Charlie Chan. Readers and moviegoers agreed, uh, greeted Charlie Chan warmly, seeing him as an attractive character who is portrayed as intelligent, heroic, benevolent and honourable in contrast to the racist depictions of evil or conniving Asians which often dominated Hollywood and national media in the early 20th century. However, in later decades, critics increasingly took a more ambivalent view of the character, finding that despite his good qualities, Chan also reinforces condescending Asian stereotypes, such as an alleged incapacity to speak idiomatic English and a tradition-bound and subservient nature. Many also now find it objectionable that the role was played on screen by Caucasian actors in Yellowface. No Charlie Chan film has been produced since 1981. So, I particularly like this... this this quotation from Wikipedia here, because it also registers the changing status of something, the changing status of the critical reception of a, of a film or a character, that, like, there's never just one fixed position, like, of, of this is the right opinion to have. We can also change, we could, we could re-evaluate Charlie Chan now and have a completely different um, opinion of this character. Um, there's a lot to say about this sort of stuff as well, but I want to whiz through. Um, Spock. Um, so from, from 1966 onwards, the character of Spock, I mean, so Spock is a Vulcan. The Vulcan has no emotions, right? So this is post-World War II. There's a lot to be said about the effect of World War II on the representations of East Asians, especially in Hollywood. Interesting things happen. So, for instance, during the Second World War, in the British context, um, there were no longer any, any negative representations of the Chinese allowed in Britain because China was our ally against Japan, Japan and Germany. So it all just changed, boom, like kind of British Orientalism, they all, that all just got put on pause for a minute. However, Japan became fair game. Kamikaze, samurai, these new, these new stereotypes come in. So what is the kamikaze? The kamikaze is a pilot who, if they realise that it's not going too well for them in their aeroplane, they'll use their aeroplane as a weapon and blast it into the American 
battleships in the South Pacific. And there's all sorts of different uh, issues here. But in, in the Western context, it's like, my God, these people will just kill themselves, sacrifice themselves for the cause, the nation, the emperor, whatever. Spock comes out of this tradition. But Spock is a, he's got a mixture of, he's kind of Charlie Chan, but without the slapstick. So, so Spock is lovable, but he's also the faithful lapdog attendant to Captain Kirk, James T. Kirk. Spock, so Spock's a good guy who's struggling with emotions, like having them. So you're seeing lots of different racial stereotypes condensed into Spock, coming out with a different, in a different iteration, a different variant. Spock is on the side of right. He's a good guy. He's the New Japan. The New Japan that after the American occupation ended in 1955, was presenting itself as non-militaristic and utterly technological. We'll get to, we might have time to talk about the, the representations of, of East Asia caused by these, these, these different kind of historical events. So Japan, from the 1950s onwards, becomes represented as the technology society, new technology. So East Asia in the West is either depicted as the most ancient of civilizations, ancient China, ancient, or technological modernity. Asians are tech. Japan is tech. Spock is a mixture of tech. Spock does, he does like Vulcan Aikido. He does that thing where he puts his thing and you go, oh, and that's his one move. The one move that Spock's got is, it's like pressure point fight, pressure point fight. And there's also, that's a different discussion, isn't it? Okay. That's, that's. So, we have different variants of Orientalism, different iterations, straightforward racism, affection, Charlie Chan, uh, mystification and, and, and um, sexual desire, Anna Mae Wong, that kind of stuff going on. And then the most famous one that you probably all know is that scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark, where Harrison Ford, or whatever his name is, what's his name? in the film? Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. Meant to be going to have a, 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 a battle to the death with this guy. This guy comes on, twirls his sword and has to laugh. <laughs> Shoots him. We all laugh. Ha <laughs> ha. And, and uh, it's a great scene. But it's completely orientalist. The whole film is just hordes of natives with their turbans on. His death matters not a jot. We, he has no backstory, we don't care about this guy, he gets shot, we laugh. That's an Orientalist structure, that's the kind of, that's the, the kind of thing that um, would, shape, would be called racism, and it's the kind of anti-Arab, anti-Middle East racism that Edward Said is exercised by. But the structure of Raiders of the Lost Ark and Indiana Jones, all the way through the films, He's almost always got like a good sidekick. That guy who goes, Indy, Indy. And he's actually a, a, a British actor, isn't he? I can't remember his name. I'm not very good with, with actors' names. So you've got your good native informant, and the rest of them are all the same. And then your evil henchmen. In this, the evil henchmen are the Nazis. Um, so, but the, the, all the features are still present there of Orientalism and classic colonial racism. I mean, what is this guy anyway? He's a thief. He's a European colonialist, imperialist thief. He's going to steal stuff from tombs. He's a tomb raider. He's a thief. He's going to steal the Elgin marbles and put them in the British Museum and go there. They're much nicer there than they are in Greece. I'm called Elgin, by the way. These are my marbles. You know, this story's still going on zoos, museums. This is just like this is just European countries going places, stealing stuff and going, it looks nice there, doesn't it? Giraffes happy there, elephants happy in that little enclosure there. That's just nineteenth century thievery. British European colonialism theft. British Museum stolen, 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 stolen. And Greece is like, can we have our marbles back, please? No. 
They're much better in London. Um, and that's, we still live that now. So that's not, that's a different discussion. Everything's always a different discussion. What time is it? Should we have a break now? Yeah, we'll have five minutes now. And then we look at more films. Because films we like. <laughs>